Dear friends, today we will start our discussion on Nobel laureates of a superconductivity. We will be having this class in two or three sessions. In the first session, we will be focusing upon the discovery of the superconductivity, which happened way back long in 1911. And you know, and it was awarded a Nobel Prize within two years in 1920, as you can see from the slide. And then there was a long period as far as the history of superconductivity has been concerned. Then came the BCS theory proposed by the three scientists who awarded the Nobel Prize. The BCS theory was proposed in 1957 and were given the Nobel Prize in the year 1972. Perhaps you may be able to complete only up to these two portions in this opening lecture. But in the for coming lectures, we will be focusing upon the tunneling aspect, which has been discovered in 1958, 60 and 62, especially in connection with the superconductivity and with the semiconductors and has been awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1973. Then, a very important discovery that happened in 1986, it was the high temperature superconductors. Just after one year, those two scientists, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1987, Petronas and Mola. We'll discuss in the second, in the second session. Then, the next, the Nobel Prize that has been awarded was for vortex physics, generally speaking. But this was a very, very old concept as far as the history of superconductivity has been concerned. And all those major theories happened in 1950s, but they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2003. So let's start our class with the discovery of a superconductivity. As I said, the superconductivity was discovered by Hake Kamerling Onnes. He was a Dutch physicist and he was very interested in working with low temperature physics. It was he who liquefied the helium and perhaps he had a very good experimental setup, a cryogenic lab where he was working in the University of Leiden, where he worked from 1882 to 1923. He was a student of Gustav Kirchhoff. You would have heard the name of Kirchhoff a long time. Uh, from 1871 to 73, all these aspects added up to his research. He was doing his experiment with the mercury. He selected mercury. You know why he selected mercury. He had this uh, wonderful idea. If you reduce the impurities in a metal, you can reduce the resistance in it. Of course, if you reduce the temperature, the atomic oscillation will slow down. As a result of it, the resistance will produce. We call these quantized oscillations of four norms nowadays, but during those days in 19 knots, the concepts of quantum mechanics were not fully developed. Then we find he selected this uh, metal mercury. He selected this mercury because mercury is a metal, not just the metal, it was a liquid. So it was good to purify it, very easy to purify it. Since it was a liquid, uh, it could be purified in a much more easier manner by evaporation techniques. So he selected it and he was doing the experiment. As we do the experiment, we can see that he was getting a gradual pattern. The resistance of the mercury gradually came down. I can see on the, uh, on the, on the slide, the graph which won the Nobel Prize for him. You can see the resistance of mercury coming down from 0.15, reaching at around 0.11. One, one, then something dramatic thing happened at 4.2 Kelvin. 
at 4.2 Kelvin. Remember, it is a very, very low temperature. It is 4.2 Kelvin. The resistance of the mercury suddenly dropped from around 0 0.11 ohm to around 10 to the power minus 5 ohm, which means the DC resistance has almost disappeared. And this was what he observed. The mercury has passed into a new state which on account of its extraordinary electrical properties may be called superconducting state. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the year 1913. And these were the words of the Nobel Committee said during the giving away of this Nobel Prize for his investigations in the properties of the matter at low temperatures which led into earlier to the production of liquid helium. We hear the words liquid helium there that has been specified by the Nobel Committee but of course we know definitely the superconductivity was also in the mind of the Nobel Committee when he was awarded this award, this prestigious award. Then after the discovery of the Nobel Committee, after discovering the superconductivity a lot many, there was a big boost in the research in the superconductivity. A lot many important factors happened. Many scientists tried to find out how you can explain this phenomena of the superconductivity. By 1950s, we have got a developed quantum mechanical theory. And with the help of all of them, they were trying to find out to give an explanation of the superconductivity. But it was in the year 1957. But the three American physicists, John Berdeen, Leon and Cooper, and Robert Schrieffer, who gave a quantum mechanical theory for the occurrence of a superconductivity. And they were given the Nobel Prize in the year 1972 for their jointly developed theory of superconductivity, usually called as BCS theory. Now the first man, John Berdeen was a very simple man, it has been said. We used to don't have that feeling that he is a great genius. And perhaps you should remember this name, John Bardeen, because he was the only person in the physics who won the Nobel Prize twice. The first one, he won it for his discovery of um, diodes and the later one for superconductivity. There is an interesting, uh, interesting the thing that happened during is the first reception of the Nobel Award when the King Gustav the Sixth Adolf he asked where is your family because uh, Berdin only brought his single his only he only bought uh, one child he said I will bring everyone when I receive the prize the next time and as he kept up his word in 1972 the second one was uh, Cooper. Uh, we, we we come to more about, we, we always remember his name whenever we associate ourselves with the superconductors because we have to speak about the Kuba pairs. And those Kuba pairs are the pairing of the electrons which we speak very recently, very now. And the third one was John Robert Schrieffer. Schrieffer was indeed the research assistant to John Berdeen. He initially worked up on the electron conductivity on the semiconductor surfaces and later words joined the Berdeen in his research on the superconductors. And it was precisely in the 1957 when he was in the subway of the New York railway station. A wonderful idea happened to Shri for that instead of treating one pair, one Cooper pair, you had to treat the entire Cooper pairs together. And he immediately wrote that equation and showed to the Berdin. And Berdin immediately recognized the significance of that equation. And there they produced the 1957, the wonderful paper. And this is the paper, the physical review paper, 1957. The theory of the superconductivity, the physical review paper that has been published by Berdin, Cooper and Schrafer. And now a small word about the Cooper pairs. We know the Cooper pairs are the pairing up of an electron. When we speak about electron, we know the electrons are fermions and one electron doesn't like another electron, doesn't like to pair up with another, another electron. We know about the Pauli's exclusion principle. 
but somehow we are speaking about a kind of a pairing that is happening in the superconductors. How this pairing actually happens? As far as the BCS theory has been concerned, there is a kind of a pairing with the first electron. The first electron moves through a superconductor. What happens is it will produce a kind of a modulation. It modulates the phonons. Phonons are the quantized atomic oscillations. These atomic oscillations, atoms are in continuous oscillations inside the material and these atomic oscillations are quantized. These atomic oscillations are quantized and the quantized atomic oscillations are called the phonons. And when electron, the superconducting electron, the first electron moves towards these uh, uh, atomic oscillations, it will create a kind of a modulation, a perturbation there. And after this modulation, the first electron leaves the space. It goes away, but the modulation will not die away. The second electron is attracted to this modulation and in a way couples the first electron through this modulation through this phonon. So it's kind of a virtual coupling between these two electrons. The first electron through a phonon couples the second electron and forms a kind of a pair. And such pairing is called as Kuma pairs. And the significant contribution of the Shrifa was that initially we were thinking about the Cooper was speaking about the quantum mechanical state of a single Cooper pair. The Shrifa came to say, no, 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 not a single Cooper pair. He has to think about the entire condensate, entire Cooper pairs together. And he formed it and they were able to arrive at the correct theory. And some of the important successes of this uh, 1957 theory, which you can see here, is the first one, they were to successfully explain a sec the superconductivity as a second order phase transition at the critical temperature. So one of your assignments will be to see what is the difference between a first order phase transition and a second order phase transition. What is the difference between the changing of the melting of an ice or the boiling of a water compared with changing of the superconducting state from a normal state to a superconducting state. As I said before, the superconducting transition is a second order phase transition, which is a continuous phase transition, whereas the first order phase transition involves a latent heat. It there will be a change of entropy and volume and energy in associated with the first order phase transition. And as a point of an assignment, you have to submit the difference between the first order phase transition and second order phase transition along with examples. And this BCS theory was able to conclusively prove that the transition of the superconductivity or the transition from the normal phase to the superconducting phase is a second order phase transition, continuous phase transition. Secondly, they were able to explain the electronic specific heat varying in a kind of an exponential level. If anything that has been varying in an exponential level in this particular manner, it hints at the kind of a band curve. So, there was an inference of a possibility of a band cap in the superconductivity associated with the superconductivity. And the BCS theory was able to explain this band cap, this change in the band cap, the variation of the band cap with, res with respect to the temperature. Thirdly, they were able to explain the Meissner ocean field effect. And this is the Meissner effect. You take a superconductor, you take a material a normal material and place inside a magnetic field. You can find here from the slide the magnetic fields penetrate, penetrate into the material. Then you reduce the temperature, you reduce the temperature and when it, the temperature becomes a critical temperature Tc, the magnetic fields are expelled, the magnetic fields are expelled from this material. That's measure of that. We call it as a perfect diamagnetism. Perfect diamagnetism. As Kemperin in the 1911 said, superconductivity means absence of zero DC resistance. This perfect diamagnetism is the another characteristic property of the superconductivity. Perhaps if this property was discovered earlier, we are called we would have called the superconductivity as perfect diamagnetism because you cannot derive one 
property from another property. You cannot derive the perfect DC conductivity from this Meissner effect, this perfect diamagnetism, and the vice versa. We cannot derive from the first principles. So this expulsion of the magnetic field, the Meissner effect, was explained by the BCS theory. Then the depth penetration depth that has been associated with the lengths that have been associated with the superconductivity. The two important lengths that are associated with the superconductivity, the first one is the London penetration depth, as you can see on the slide. Outside the superconductor, which is on the left hand side, you can see the magnetic field is B0. Just inside the superconductor, you find this field, this magnetic field decaying down. We have the equation Bx is equal to B0 e to the power minus x by lambda L. You put the value of x is equal to lambda L, you get B0 e to the power minus lambda L by lambda L, which correspond to B0 e to the power minus 1. So this lambda L is that value to inside that superconductor where the original magnetic field B0 will become the 1 by E value of that B0. I hope it is clear. It is that length inside the superconductor where the original value B0 will become e to the power minus 1 value of that original value. That length is called the London penetration depth and that has been proposed by the London brothers. The London brothers in the year, uh, London, London brothers Fritz and Haynes, they proposed this London equation. A super, and this BCS theory was give, was able to give a good explanation or BCS theory naturally was able to pro, reproduce this random penetration tap. Then there is this coherence length. What is this coherence length? Coherence length is a range in the superconductor in which the superconducting electrons remain in the same state in partially varying magnetic field. In simple language you say how much one electron in a super pair how long the one electron in a Cooper pair has to go to see the second electron, that distance, that distance, that distance is the coherence length. Now this BCS theory is also able to explain the isotope effect. Isotope effect is given by this equation m alpha t to the power c is equal to k, where m is the isotopic mass, tc is the critical temperature, k is a constant. BCS theory 1957 gives the value alpha as 0.5. There is nothing sacred about 0.5 as Charles Keeter used to say and as has been very well known because you can have a range of values near to 0.5. It's never 0.5 especially except in the case of the mercury. You can have the values vary. So this isotopic mass, this isotopic effect means the, the critical temperature of the superconductor changes with this isotopic mass with respect to the above equation that I just said. So I will be finishing with the first class here. As I said to you as the lecture, what you have to do is you have to, as an assignment part, you have to study about the GL theory, especially you have to study about the two different forms of the phase transition. What is their inherent difference? the two different types of the phase transitions, you study about it. Secondly, it will be good if you can just make a read about the BCS theory. Just one or two para one or two pages of this BCS theory. It is a, it is a very lengthy paper, around 34 pages of a uh, physical review paper, but it will be good if you can read, if you can very well understand the, uh, the first initial portions of it, uh, two or three pages of the physical review paper that will be also an initiation to read the research papers to it because since you are very much interested in the physics the physics of superconductors it will be a good taste you can read the great researches are written on the paper so wish you all very well we'll see you again soon in the next lecture interesting lectures where we'll see some of the effects of the superconductors the tunneling effect the josephson effect its derivations followed by the interesting discovery of the high temperature superconductors and the resurfacing of the research in the superconductors immediately after this discovery of HTS, high temperature superconducting materials.
followed by the vortex physics which has its importance as you are all physics students. Have a nice day. May God bless you. Thank you.